Welcome to Drummer's Debate, Episode 7, and today we have Tobias Ralph. Nice How you to doing? Be, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for yeah. coming. I'm so excited about this. Absolutely. Um, your playing is amazing, by the way. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love watching your videos on YouTube, your crazy fast single stroke rolls. <laughs> love those, man. Lots of coffee. I'm <laughs> <you>. <laughs> <laughs> so today's topic is dynamics okay. and Great. the importance the importance that dynamic has to a drummer. Mm -hmm. Now, do you feel that dynamics are important and why are dynamics important as a drummer? Um, absolutely. Dynamics are uh, crucial, uh, essential to being a good drummer um, because um, one of the main things is, is being sensitive to the type of music you're playing, whether it's a ballad or a rock song or whatever, but um, you know you have to be sensitive to that and be sensitive to if you're working with a vocalist and other musicians, um, especially if you're playing jazz, um, to you know kind of make room or create space for the the different uh, instruments. You know, if the bass solo, there's a bass player and he's playing upright bass, you can't be sort of overstepping him you know and and um i think um one of the important things for all drummers um all musicians is to know you know when to create space and and when to to um you know because that's that's sort of what creates tension um and a lot of the music some of the music that i play where i'm playing sort of some techno drum and bass type of stuff and those patterns don't necessarily have a lot of dynamics in them because some of them are, you know, you're, you're trying to sort of play like a machine in a way. But where dynamics come is when you sort of drop out and create space and all of a sudden you create this drama um, which amps people up. And then you come back in and everything, everybody wants to dance, you know. So that's, you know... That's where dynamics can work in that type of music, but um, obviously in jazz. And, you know, um, you know, one of the things that I learned growing up when I was playing in a lot of sort of um, R&B uh, nightclubs in the West Village, you know, the Groove and Cafe Wa and all these places was that, you know, you always break it down for the verse. And, you know, this way the singer is not having to struggle and everybody can hear it and you create, the, you know, a level of uh, tension, good tension, where, you know, people can, are not struggling to hear what the vocals say and, and then stuff builds up to the chorus and big and then down. And those things are what, um, you know, what make music, makes good music good. Yeah, so definitely. Because, you know, I mean... Um, I mean, in all sorts of music, even in, um, you know, everything from country and Western to, uh, to even, um, you know, to, to certain hip hop stuff where, you know, again, it's sort of like the, the element in electronic music where, yes, a lot of these patterns are programmed and all that, but what creates the tension is when the drums drop out and all of a sudden there's just maybe this sort of drone that's going on and, a guy is rapping over that or something's happening and then the drums kick in and all of a sudden people react you know though that's a, a real positive thing about tension um, the way I like to think about it um, and also in playing grooves themselves um, I, I thought oh, it was a really important thing that Steve Gatto was stressed was creating um, sort of what we call hills and valleys in a groove meaning that you know if you're playing a groove and there's a lot of ghost notes you're not playing all those ghost notes and everything at the same level as your backbeat you know those ghost notes are sort of there to kind of create this pulse that sort of propels the groove forward um but they're not played at all the same level you know um and I think that's one of the things that what we call, when I, I like to call it hills and valleys, is that, um, you know, it gives a groove, it makes a groove feel good. And it gives it, um, you know, it helps create a pocket, you know, where the groove is sitting really well. 
you know, and it's that's, you know, I could pinpoint uh, probably like um, the Purdy shuffle, Bernard Purdy, you know, and a tune. I was just playing that recently. Yeah. I love that shuffle. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, it's that's a perfect example of like, um, like a tune like Home at Last, you know, where it's doing, and you have this sort of triplet, 16th note triplet pulse going throughout the groove that sort of propels the groove and gives it this, um, you know, for lack of a better term, I guess this, this hump, you know what I mean? Where it's sort of, you know, you feel the groove and it makes you want to dance, makes you want to bob your head. Right. Um, you know, so I think that's another example of, of dynamics within a groove, you know, and um, so I think, again, like dynamics within the groove, space is also really important you know the space between the notes you know as it was a revelation for me when i was sort of starting to play a lot of r&b or funk music that you know r&b music is not necessarily this sort of you know okay you got to lay back it's not necessarily think about laying back on the beat but it's it's the space between the notes that makes it feel good. You know, if you ever really listen to like some James Brown tunes or, you know, it's not it's not laid back, but it's the space between the notes. You know, this you know, it's, yeah, those it's pauses the, and the breaks. the pauses in between, mm -hmm. you know, it's like or even a little bit later like um listening to um a tune like Shining Star by Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, where there's these spaces between the notes that make it feel so good. Like boom, it's good going, it's good going, it's good going, it's good going, it's good going. you know. Right. It's like the groove breathes, you know. So there's there's those two ways of thinking where when you're putting ghost notes in, that can help make a groove feel better. But sometimes I've done sessions where guys have been like okay take out all the ghost notes you know but you gotta so then it's your job to make that space in between feel good and place the notes in the proper place you know whether it's you know you're doing it with a click or not doing it with a click it's gotta it's gotta you have to sort of place everything exactly where it's supposed to be you know like um and not uh not push it or pull it back but just place it exactly where it is and the space in between those notes will sort of give it that you know <laughs> oops <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always my phone man <laughs> it's okay <laughs> we're we're oh, my brother wants me to move my car <laughs> oh shoot damn it I can hear him <laughs> alright I'll be right back yeah, dude, no problem I'm here hello I am. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm coming. I'll, I'll come uh, move the car. I know you got to leave. I just heard you start the car. All right, bro. All right, guys, we're back. Sorry about that. <laughs> Always yeah. happens to me. Hey, it's okay, man. <laughs> Where were we? Oh, uh, we're talking about dynamics within the groove. Yes, yes. You know? I always felt like uh, dynamics it's really important to convey the emotion of the part. Mm -hmm. So if everybody else is low, yeah, I think you need to go low with them. Mm -hmm. Or if they're high and, they, and that energy level is, is just very forward and very, very powerful, you need to excel and, and raise your dynamic level, your volume level, and, and, and match the rest of the band. Absolutely. Uh, it's... it's um... You know, that's that's part of being a, a good musician is sort of creating that energy, you know, that tension and, and, and sort of um, responding also to what is going on in the music. You know, that's um, it's like, you know, that's your that's your duty you right. know, as as a musician, as a good musician is to be also in addition to playing with good time and groove or swing. Um, it's. Uh, you know, it's it's your responsibility to um, react and to be supportive of your, 
you know, your the other people in the group, you know, that's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's got to be a sort of a, almost like a marriage, you know, of, of everybody and, and that you respond and that, okay, you know, so this is, you know, the one person in the group, this is their moment to shine. So you have to be supportive of that, you know. Um, it's like, um, and you can see, it, you know, in examples of all types of music, like if you ever listen to sort of some early weather report um, stuff where like live and it's like Jocko and Peter Erskine are just, you know, they're in there and they're sitting in the pocket and they're smoking but they're smoking like at a real low level, low level yeah, yeah. and they're just simmering there while, you know, Joe or, or Wayne are just kind of blowing over it, but they're just giving them that support and cooking it, you know what I mean? And they're not, you know, they're not sort of distracting the groove or taking away. Sometimes they kind of respond to what the souls is doing, which you can do in that type of music, but then they're back in there and they're just in there, okay, sitting here and we're just going to burn it you know what i mean right, and that's yeah. that's so and and then you know if you're playing in sort of more pop oriented stuff it's also sort of the same thing is to sort of you know create those create those dynamics you know where there's there's um you know it's like um you could take any sort of like a you know country and western tune like a tune by tim mcgraw or you know willie nelson or any of these people and and you know it's always you know the verses are always broken down you can hear the guy go to the cross stick you know um so that's that those are the types of things that you have to be you know your ears have to be open to 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 that you know and going and going okay what do I need to do here? What does a singer need? You know? And and also, you know, sort of as a drummer responding lyrically to what's going on, if it's a vocal tune, you know, trying to get inside of the tune because it's, as a drummer, it's, um, you know, it's sort of tougher for us to kind of convey emotion because we're not, you know, we don't play stuff that necessarily indicates melody or harmony. You know, we're sort of just dealing, we're dealing with rhythmic, you know. So, you know, we sort of have to, you know, kind of create, either people are going to nod their heads to it and get into it, or, you know, we're just playing something that's very supportive. You know, it's, it's again, like what made guys like Steve Gadd and Jim Keltner and Jeff Beccaro so amazing is that they somehow... You know, um, Levon Helm, Ringo Starr, Steve Jordan, um, all these guys. What makes them so great is that, you know, they are they are somehow able to convey emotion from the drum set, and you know, just like listen to the groove and just get shivers, like right. chills, like oh my god, this is so great. You know what I mean? So or aggression like this is you know that's that's you know it's sort of like again listening to music where it can make you cry or it can make you sort of chomp at the bit you know just like you know <laughs> you know which is sort of you know why i sort of like a lot of the stuff that's happening now with you know sort of this some of the blast beat stuff that's happening because First of all, I mean, technically it's amazing, obviously, and challenging, but it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, you can feel like the aggression of like, going for it, you know right, what I mean? Like, yeah. this is like, you know. Anger. Anger, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, you know, and I think um, that when done right, it's, you know, it's a healthy place to, to let it out, to let your emotions come out you know in a healthy way definitely you know i have a question um growing up just getting into the drums i had a very very bad habit of just playing as loud as i can mm -hmm. by myself mm -hmm. and on top of that 
just starting out with musicians also just starting out mm -hmm. i'd be competing against guys that's playing with amps on volume 10 mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. all the time all the time yeah so i'm trying to keep up with that yeah of course and i got into that habit of having to play heavy yeah. all the time heavy sure. and loud all the time how would you say is a good way to improve your dynamics if you're not used to playing at low volumes? Good, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I would say, I mean, and that's something that's, you know, that's a, a very, I think, standard thing, especially to just kind of get on there, you know, and, and, and it's hard because, you know, let's face it, drums are a loud instrument by nature, you know what I mean? So we have to kind of figure out all sorts of ways to kind of, um, you know, to work on our dynamics. Um, so I, I, you know, um, I think one of the things that was that was helpful for me was to a um, start sort of practicing. You know, even from a technical standpoint, rudiments, but at a lower level. You know, so I could sort of get used to you know, sort of having a sort of, not necessarily tighter grip, but just a little more control over the the, new, the smaller nuances of, of my technique. And then, and then applying that into a groove where, you know, uh, uh, taking something simple like uh, a paradiddle and uh, playing that in a groove situation like, you know, hi-hat on the... And getting all those notes that are being played on the snare drum and the hi-hat, hi sort of bringing them down, you know, so like there was a definite differentiation between the backbeat and those dynamics, you know what I mean? But, but also kind of just being able to um, figure out a way to sort of also keep that groove going and keep people feeling something but without having to to dig in really hard you know um and uh, you know I, I would say definitely say that like working on on playing softer in terms of technique wise sort of helped me a little bit you know because then my hands were sort of more in tune with how the sticks were operating you know, I wasn't kind of making these grandiose motions or, you know, but I was, I was sort of coming down here and trying to figure out, okay, how can I get, you know, a good pocket and, and but not be overpowering, you know, but just enough to kind of give people that sense of, of groove, you know what I mean? So, so for me, it was, it was just, it was just, you know, and also playing a lot of different types of music, you know, having to play in a quiet jazz trio right yeah. you know you can't where play like swing yeah where you're at not a heavy metal volume <laughs> no you know where you're listening you're having to listen to an upright bass you know and you're having to adjust that mm -hmm. so what do i do you know okay yeah I, i'll i'll can switch to a smaller stick with a, a smaller tip getting a smaller sound but also i have to kind of figure out ways you know technically to use the sort of the smaller muscles that are in my hand, so maybe more from my fingers, you know, and and not from the wrist, but from down here, you know, and and trying to just kind of keep things down, but you know, the stick control is very important. Stick control, yeah, you know, I mean, and and um, you know, when I was growing up, I, I remember taking a two-week course. Um, with Peter Erskine um, at the collective and he talked very much about dynamics and he was able to play at a really low volume and really you know burn you know or just you know or play simply but it was very you know he was aware of space and he was aware of how to come down and be reactive to the music settings around him and not to get in the way of the soloist or the vocalist you know like sort of listening and using your ears what's going on um so i think that that was a big a big thing would you say that uh like the stick that you use mm -hmm. is a very important part 
to the type of music that you play. So like if I'm playing jazz with like a heavy 5B, like a heavier 5B, mm -hmm. um, opposed to playing with like a 7A or a 5A, yeah. would that affect your playing? Or, or, well, I guess the question is, is stick weight important in terms of dynamics? I, I think it. I think it does play into it. I. I would say that you know, uh, it is one of those things where you have to be able to sort of play whatever type of music you play, or play. You know, if you have to even play soft, but you should be able to do it with just about any stick. You know, and um, you know that's that's the sort of thing, and that's where you have to adjust your technique. I. I definitely do think you know, like yes you know, ha having a stick that's sort of a lighter stick or made for more of a jazz thing is definitely something you need to have. And, you know, you'll adjust it. But sometimes all we have is like, you know, freaking behemoth sticks, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So we have to sort of figure out what to do when we'd have that situation. You know, it was like, you know, like guys like uh, Tony Williams, you know, used like, two B-sized drumstick. That's you know? nuts. I did not know that. Yeah, he used a big stick. But, you know, and, and Tony primarily was a very aggressive player. Even and, when he was swinging yeah. with, like, Miles Davis oh, when he was I, using a 2B? I, I think so. I don't know what he was using with Miles Davis. He might have been using something, but, like, he pretty much, you know, later on was using a bigger stick, you know. And, um, but, you know, he was able to to swing his butt off, you know, no matter what he used, you know, and, and but he was able to sort of adjust and he had enough of the sort of the technical know-how, you know, to kind of go, okay, you know, here's what needs to be happen, you know what I mean, and what I need to do, you know, so sometimes that means like kind of choking up on the stick a little bit so you're, so you don't have such a big range of motion that you're, you know, you're kind of keeping it down here and then working more from you know, the fingers as opposed to sort of big motions, you know, and you yeah, sort of, right. you know, yeah, you kind of try and keep, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, you know, I think that's, that's, um, I, I, you know, I think you should be able to, I, you know, it's easier said than done, but, it, you <laughs> know, is, is to be able to sort of play with um, whatever stick that you might have at your disposal and be able to sort of play that, you know, play whatever kind of style you have to play. I mean, it's it's tough, you know. I mean, I've been forced to in some situations like the complete opposite, like having to play a heavy rock gig and you you know, and all of a sudden you have like a seven A in your bag, and you're like, oh, yeah. and pretty soon you're like snapping off sticks mm -hmm. left and right, mm -hmm. um, you know. But you sort of have to figure out how to make it work. Um, so I think that that's, you know, to me always the mark of someone who, you know, is is really good at their craft is that they can sort of pick up whatever, you know, is at their disposal and sort of figure out how to make it work. Definitely, I agree 100%. You know? so, so, yeah, I definitely think that, uh, you know, sticks do come into play into that um but you have to you know you sort of have to be willing to figure out how to to make whatever you have work you know and so sometimes it's not necessarily going to be the stick but sometimes it's your technique that you have to adjust like okay you know i got to or or where you're you know where you're striking the symbol you know is okay this is not going to if i strike up here it's not going to create so much spread so let me do this down here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's that's the, the bulk and the most important thing, I think, you know? Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm still trying to improve my dynamics. It's so hard, um, especially when you've been playing in metal bands consistently. Oh, sure. Heavy rock bands. Absolutely. It's um, a totally different, you know, it's a totally different mindset. It's a totally different muscle set, Right. you know, for the most part. Um so, you know, it's sort of about figuring out how to do it, you know, and and also, you know, figuring out how to, how to, you know, sort of hit the drum the right way, 
where you're kind of getting the most out of the cymbal and the most out of the drum. It's like um, um, like hitting the the cymbal on the edge opposed to hitting it. Yeah, the well, time. you know, and you look at someone like um, you know, like C. Smith, you know, who sort of was playing a lot with Journey and playing very heavy, and then he sort of slipped and went to back into the jazz mode, you know, mm -hmm. and was playing a lot of jazz and really refined his playing in that way, you know, but then he went back out on the road with Journey, but he sort of had a better idea of technically how to get a bigger sound, you know, when he came back to Journey without expending the energy that he used to expend, you know, and so it was like, okay, I'm going to hold the stick a little bit looser this way, or, you know, let, let the stick kind of work for me and, and, and let, you know, and not choke up on the stick. You know, so when I hit the tom, we're getting the full resonance of the tom, you know, and sort of right. those those kind of things. And and so it's, you know, it's kind of like, all right, it can, I can slip back and forth in between these different, you know. Like when you hit a snare, you don't need a lot of power to hit a rim shot and make mm -mm. it sound loud. No, not at all. You know, it's, it's like, I mean, yes, we all have seen videos where the drummer is like, ah, God, you know. Yeah, that's, really hard. <laughs> it's, you know, whatever. But... You know, you also want to you want to be able to just get a huge sound just by staying here, you know, and not and not working hard. I agree. I yeah. think there's a there's a fine line between the limit of of volume you can actually get a drum to mm -hmm. you know to produce. Mm -hmm. So like those guys that and I love seeing it. Those guys with the crazy emotion that's hitting the drum super hard. Oh yeah, that's show. Yeah, it's you don't need to hit the drums that hard to make it sound that loud no not at all it's all technique yeah where you hit the drum how you hit the drum exactly where the power is coming from if coming from your wrist your arm your yeah. your fingers absolutely i think that's really important too and that's what i'm learning now um i think as drummers we always there's it's just it's a never-ending learning process yeah there's always something to learn something to oh, improve yeah. on which is why i love it so much absolutely it's like an, yeah an if you can't you know it's like the moment you start you stop learning is sort of the moment you kind of you know the stuff starts to kind of go downhill so it's like you know you still have to find ways to stay inspired you know i mean that's why it's like hanging out with alex cohen you know has been great because he's you know a go-getter and very inspiring you know so and you know for me sort of i'm on the you know i'm way closer to 50 then and then to you play like a 40 you know you play, you play like you're 20 <laughs> you still have all the grooves well available, you know so. i try but that's but that's sort of you know i mean do you feel any different from when you played when you were younger oh sure you know i mean it's you know there's the re, the recovery time is always not as quick as you know you'd like it to be or you know it's or you get warmed up and you go in and then the moment you stop it's like oh boy everything is like cold again you have to kind of re <laughs> you start the process it's not like your body is not like this you know i, I could never furnace, tell you know? i couldn't tell i couldn't tell <laughs> when i see roy haynes play yeah he's well, like 80 it. years old a guy he still has all his chops i'm pretty sure he has those you know age problems but it, uh, i can't know, but see it, it in his playing no you know what i mean and that's it you know the that making music and and drumming and all that you know it kind of keeps you young you know and and hey you know whatever maybe we have you know trouble getting out of bed or trouble you know getting from one room to the next but you know these guys get on the set and it's you know i'm going for it and, you know and, and because you know that's you know that's like excitement you and know, it's just programmed into you know it's like this is what i do and that's what i love you know and i'm still you know get fascinated by muscle memory is still there yeah muscle memory is still there and it's you know it's it's it's, it's inherent and it's what is part of what you do you know it's sort of like yeah man this is this is me you know and this is that's you know uh, it's like, uh, I don't know, I think somewhere like maybe Kenny Aronoff said, you know, he's like, yeah, you know, he's like, it'll take, you know, 
someone cutting off my hands for me to ever stop drumming. <laughs> you know, so he's like, I'm going to try and keep doing for as long as I absolutely can. You know, until, you know, God forbid, I can't hold the drumstick. Mm -hmm. You know, so then tie some tape around me. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, and there's lots of people and very inspiring people who are out there who've, you know, had tragedy in their life and, and roadblocks, and but, you know, have always figured out a way to come back to playing drums. You know what I mean? And uh, so, you know, that's, I mean, my friend Ray LeVere, you know, if you check out, you know, I mean, Ray was in a horrific accident, you know, an explosion, and, you know, half of his body was burned. And he figured out a way to hold drumsticks and it's amazing what he can I do. I did see videos. Yeah, it's amazing. I did see videos. And he's killing, killing, you know, and it's probably one of the most inspiring things to see. Definitely. He reinvented yeah. how to play drums for himself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's you know? really so, passionate. Yeah. So, you know, if someone can come through that kind of tragedy and, and figure it out and do it, and kill it, you know, and then, God forbid, you know, or, you know I'm going to figure out how to keep doing this and, and not let myself get depressed or about, you know, stuff or why I can't do this on the drum set or, you know, why life is difficult at this point, you know. It's always going to be some, there's always going to be some sort of difficulties, you right, know, right. in life, but, you know. That's life. <laughs> it's life, and, and, you know, and the drums and everything should be the place where you come to, like, okay, I'm going to let it all hang out, you know? And Do you? I have a quick question. I noticed you was holding the stick traditionally. Mm -hmm. You usually switch between tra traditional and match grip. I, I do. You know, I, I used to play, um, I used to play a lot of match grip, you know, and, but it was funny because I can never do, um, you know, I never could get a really nice clean single stroke roll playing traditional grip like it I could sort of do a lot of the paradiddle stuff like that and I could get around the set okay but it was sort of when it was focused here I couldn't really you know um, I feel the same way yeah when I, when I was in uh, high school and I did the marching band for your for for my first semester there I felt like Naturally, I just wanted to hold a yeah, stick sure. match. I guess that's just a natural thing to, Absolutely. to hold a stick. You know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things where, okay, uh, when it's matched, I can, you know, I can sort of, you know, get around the set a lot more and get a lot of power, you know. I mean, of course, you know, and, and playing traditional grip never stopped, buddy. You yeah, know, of course. You know, <laughs> it never stopped. So, and I think there's a, a real validity to both grips. Definitely, um, especially know. the way your snare drums angle. The yeah, no, it's, and it works different different types of muscles, and it's sort of you know I know that sometimes when I start playing jazz, my natural thing is to kind of go back to playing like Me this. Me too. You know, even though I can I can't do a lot of stuff with it. You know, I felt like traditional you know. always helped my dynamics too. For some reason, I can control my dynamics easier with the traditional grip i have no idea why well so it's also you know if you, if you look at it from a physical standpoint you know there's a lot less i guess gravity going down when you're playing traditional grip you know you have these two fingers here that are sort of kind of you have a little more control of of sort of you know what you're doing right you know right. Mm -hmm. and um you know whether it's you're playing match you know everything has got this downward you know um type of thing like gravity naturally works is working stronger here which is why you have your whole arm to yeah yeah you stuff. know which is why when you play you know it's like you can get a, a sort of a stronger sound or certain things you know but um you know it's it's this is it's it this is when you're playing sort of swing or stuff like that this definitely feels sort of more natural yeah you know so I think it's, you know, it's beneficial to try and work on both, you know what I mean? Um, and, I mean, but of course there's some credible jazz players who play match grip. You know, oh, yeah, definitely. Like Bill Stewart. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, you would see 
uh, Tony Williams a lot of times switch back and forth. You know, Tony, depending on Dennis too. Yeah, depending on what would feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so. Um, but you know the guys who are. You know, who you see like Vinny or Weckl have really got it mastered to a point where they can sort of play all sorts of different types of music with it. You know, yeah, and even get, rock. Even rock and get a lot of power. You know, just that, that power kind of, developed over time, though. That, yeah, it's a, it's a time action. thing, you know. It's it's real, you know. It's like, okay, you know, this is this is it, you know. <laughs> and it's like, okay, you know. So it's a it's a it's a multiple thing, you know, of sort of you know working on it both both ways. I think is is really beneficial, you know. And can only serve you into playing different types of music. Definitely. Know, so. Definitely. Well, I think we should wrap it up. Um, okay. Dynamics is definitely important as a drummer. It's something all drummers should practice. All Absolutely. drummers should want to practice yep. and want to learn, especially if you're in musical situations where you need to use it. Um, it's not always... Don't make it always a priority to overpower right. everybody else in the band. No, <laughs> never. Yeah. Sometimes you need to, to lay back and let everybody else groove. Yeah. You know. That's it. You need to know your role in specific situations, specific mm -hmm. parts, convey that emotion. Yeah. Now, if the whole track requires you to play high, have heavy energy, and yeah. and you need to go all out, yeah. then do it. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Exactly. But if not, try to lower your volume. Um, Actually, before we go, yeah. this is something that just came to mind mm -hmm. that I have a problem with. And many people have a problem with. So you're playing in a metal band. Yes. And this is the scenario. The scenario is you're playing in a metal band, but the room you're playing in right. requires you to play super low dynamics. Mm -hmm. So they want you to play from... Say you usually play 100% volume yeah. during certain parts. Now you have to lower it to 50%. Right. Yeah. Now that doesn't convey the emotion of that part. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and it completely changes the sound oh, yeah, sure. of that part. And so you're not really conveying that emotion of the part. It's hard to, to lower your volume and, and, and want to stay there because you're not showing the people exactly how the music is supposed to sound. Right. Now, in that situation, you have really no choice, especially if the manager of the place comes out and is like, hey, right. the bar, I can't hear anybody taking orders at the bar. Right. You need to lower your volume. Yeah. Like, what would you say in that situation? Would you just lower your dynamics or? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess you sort of have to. You have to adjust. I mean, especially you know, <laughs> if it's a paying gig, you yeah. know, it's like, okay. You know, but it's hard because, you know, there's certain types of music where, you know, played at softer levels, it doesn't really do the music justice. Exactly. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, can you imagine, you know, sort of Iron Maiden playing at the Holiday Inn, you know, yeah. and, you know, and the guy going, okay, you know, you need to play quieter, you know, like, okay, you know, how do I play this, this kind of gallop groove, but like, yeah, it just you know, doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> but, you know, so... I, I just try to stay away from you, those You know, those you got to figure out, you know, I mean, like, sometimes they have, um, you know, sound protection, you know, like, oh, I put a plexiglass mm -hmm. thing over, in fr you know, in front of the drum set, you know, have everything really controlled, you know, so the, the whole what's being put out in the house is, you know, not this overwhelming... Um, level you know and it's like okay yeah we have good distortion on the guitars but you know everything is really controlled and i've seen bands do it you know um but it does take sort of the wind out of the sails right you know it, it doesn't kind of i wouldn't want to hear an album and hear all this beautiful energy and go see them live and it's like yeah Bleh. yeah you yeah. so know it it's yeah. got to be it's got to be you know, so that, you know, that's also a certain thing of like, okay, figuring out what's, you know, the right venue to play at for that stuff and what, you know, and, and, um, but sometimes you have to kind of 
suck it up because bite the like, bullet. <laughs> gig is a gig, you know. So it's a, that's it. Yeah. You know, so. Awesome, awesome. So thank you so much, yeah. Tobias, for coming. This was my an pleasure. awesome podcast. Man, my pleasure. Um, and hopefully we can do this again. Yes, absolutely. Anytime. Thanks, guys, for watching. Thank Episode you. seven. Catch you guys <laughs> next time. <laughs> All right, awesome. Yeah, that's great.